So we're going to change in technology, go to the Mac. Speaking of technological advancement. So uh, Diane and Isla, thanks for inviting me to be here today. And uh, I see a lot of uh, familiar faces in the audience. Um, some of this stuff may be a little bit of an overlap with what Dr. Uh, Schuckman already talked about. But nevertheless, uh, there is some new stuff here. And I, uh, I hope that it's uh, informative. So we're, we're going to talk about the treatment and surveillance of non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. And um, we, we want to move away from the term superficial bladder cancer and really make that distinction. Um, so as Dr. Shuckman said, the staging, uh, when you talk about non-muscle invasive bladder cancer, is very important. Uh, TA lesions are those, obviously, that are confined to the mucosa and really account for 70% of the cases that we see in non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. T1, alternatively, is disease that's gone into the uh, lamina, pro lamina propria and accounts for about one-third of the patients that uh, present. So w when we're talking about low-grade uh, or TA disease, these lesions rarely progress, but they're very bothersome in the sense that they frequently recur. So 70% of patients that have low-grade TA disease will ultimately require another resection down the line. And factors that have an influence on recurrence are the fact that if it's multiple low-grade TA lesions, whether there is a recurrence of the first cystoscopic examination, the first surveillance cystoscopy, if you've had one recurrence, you're more likely to develop another recurrence down the line. And if the first lesion or the tumor size is more than three centimeters in size, there's a higher rate of recurrence. When we move into the high-grade uh, TA category, uh, these are uh, of low incidence because high-grade and TA usually should not go together. Uh, we think of TA as, um, as being a low risk of a progression, but it's the high grade that we have to be worried about. So because it's relatively rare, this usually requires a repeat TUR to really make sure that we've had the accurate staging. Uh, and nevertheless, even with intravesical treatment, about 50% of these lesions will recur and 25% will uh, progress. Uh, ultimately, it is a uh, potentially lethal uh, disease, as 20% of the patients may die. So this is considered a um, high-grade, high uh, despite the TA uh, component. When we move into the T1 category, uh, this has very high incidence of uh, progression into muscle invasive disease and beyond. Uh, patients that are uh, diagnosed initially with T1 disease, up to 50% of them will develop muscle invasive disease uh, within three years when they're treated with just a resection alone. And whenever we have a patient with a T1 disease, a TUR is usually, a repeat second look TUR is usually indicated, especially if there's no muscle in the specimen, to really make sure that we're making the accurate diagnosis here. In a, uh, a large study from the ERTC looking at 1,400 patients, patients who were originally diagnosed as T1 disease, even when there was muscle in the specimen, were upstaged to 10%. 10% uh, of them were upstaged to T2 disease when there was a review of the pathology. And in patients who had no muscle in the initial specimen, up to 50% of patients had residual disease or actually became muscle invasive on repeat uh, evaluation. There's some uh, literature written about the T1 uh, substaging, uh, where T1A is invasion of the superficial aspect of the muscularis mucosa, which should not be confused with muscularis propria. And obviously, the deeper you go, the more invasive the disease. Uh, some opponents uh, of this substaging argue that there is inconsistency, but there have been some trials that have shown when there is collaboration between the pathologist and the urologist when you're looking at this category, up to 90% accuracy can be achieved. Carcinoma in situ, it can certainly increase the recurrence rate from about 50% to 75% when it's concomitant with TA or T1 disease. Half of patients with carcinoma in situ will ultimately progress to muscle invasive disease down the line, and about a fifth will ultimately die of metastatic disease, even if they're treating, treated appropriately with intravesical BCG. So lifetime surveillance is the norm for all uh, non-muscle invasive bladder cancers, but especially with carcinoma in situ, the surveillance should include some uh, workup of the upper tracts because there is about a 5% uh, involvement of the upper tracts uh, with non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. Uh, 
So the important factors that determine whether a patient will ultimately recur and progress. Non-muscle invasive disease characteristically will, uh, will recur. Um, and the majority will recur if they're treated by, by TUR alone. And factors determine whether one is destined to recur or progress. Obviously, the higher the grade, uh, the more the risk. The deeper the stage, the increased risk. Multiple tumors, tumors that are bigger, associated with the uh, concept of lymphovascular invasion, the presence of carcinoma in situ, and a recurrence at the first uh, surveillance at three months after the initial diagnosis are all predictors of uh, progression and recurrence. So uh, based on some of these uh, um, uh, risk factors, uh, Sylvester looked at a large uh, uh, follow-up of about 1,500 patients and uh, risk, risk stratified patients uh, based on grade and stage. And there are really three different risk categories, low risk, intermediate risk, and high risk. And you can see in the low risk category, the uh, chances of mortality are essentially non-existent, but very high rates of recurrence, whereas when you jump down to the high risk category, about 50% of patients will recur. It's about 15% risk of progression and about 10% risk of mortality. Okay, so people always ask, well, how do you, how do you get a biopsy? And um, there's a video of what a cold cup biopsy looks like. So the initial diagnosis of anyone that presents with a lesion is to have a biopsy or a TUR because it allows for accurate histopathological assessment and also allows us to really true, uh, rule out muscle invasion. Once you get a biopsy, you use a cautery probe through the cystoscope to just coagulate the area, make sure there's no bleeding. Um, alternatively, this is what a TUR would look like. So this is a loop. It's got some electric current uh, running through it. And if that other video stops, maybe this one will start. But nevertheless, we get deep bites of a, of a lesion, trying to get as deep as possible uh, with muscle in the specimen uh, to rule out muscle invasion. Some people have util utilized laser with uh, neonidium and YAG and homium laser in terms of uh, treating lesions. These are usually good for patients who've had recurrent low-grade lesions when um, uh, they're not really thought to be deeply invasive. Has no difference in ultimately uh, on, on recurrence, but the, the fact that there is no tissue for uh, staging or grading makes it a bad uh, use for the initial diagnosis. So the role of uh, re-resection for uh, T1 disease, uh, I've alluded to this er earlier, there is going to be persistent tumor in up to 30% of patients who have initial TA disease and almost 40% of patients with uh, T1 disease. So even if the cystoscopic examination is normal, about 20% of patients will have residual uh, cancer on a repeat resection. We talked about, about high-grade TA disease being a relatively rare uh, disease entity, and only 23% of patients who were initially diagnosed as high-grade disease are actually confirmed on either review of the pathology or going back and re-resecting the site. 30% of patients who have T1 disease initially will be upstaged to T2 disease if there's no muscle in this specimen. So a second look TUR may, may be necessary to make an accurate assessment of the stage and also make uh, future recommendations regarding treatment. So intravesical uh, therapy, once you truly confirm that someone has non-muscle invasive disease, um, the, there are traditional indications of who would be an appropriate candidate to receive this. Uh, obviously, multiple and large uh, tumors, patients with early recurrence, anyone with, with high-grade disease, even in the TA category, anyone with T1 disease, the con concomitant presence of carcinoma in situ or lymphovascular, uh, lymphovascular invasion, or if there's positive cytology after resection of all visible uh, tumor. In terms of all the uh, available agents out there, uh, in the chemotherapy world, there's mitomycin, thiotepa, uh, adromycin, epirubicin, cytobine, and valrubicin. BCG is considered an immunotherapy agent uh, uh, along with interferon. Vitamins are not instilled intravesically, but there is some uh, data that's shown that if uh, you combine intravesical BCG with megadoses of vitamins, this may have an impact on tumor recurrence down the line. And uh, bropyramine is obviously no longer available and is really uh, put here for historical purposes. Um, so 
in terms of the uh, initial period when someone is diagnosed or, or gets resected with a, a bladder tumor, a perioperative installation, meaning during the initial resection period uh, or the, the biopsy, if given in the immediate postoperative period within uh, 24 hours, one single dose uh, will usually reduce tumor implantation and recurrence in up to 40 percent uh, of patients. There's been uh, a number of randomized trials which have each evaluated the uh, clinical significance of a single immediate installation um, and all have uh, shown better results in patients who have low-risk tumors. People who have intermediate or high-risk tumors usually require uh, additional uh, installation. So in terms of intravesical chemotherapy, and this does not include obviously BCG, when you compare intravesical chemotherapy to TUR alone, chemotherapy will prevent recurrence but usually does not have an impact on progression. Um, it's uh, controversial how long and how frequently intravesical chemotherapy uh, have to be given, and there's different uh, regimens uh, with different maintenance regimens as well. When comparing BCG and intravesical chemotherapy, BCG seems to be superior to thiotepa, epirubicin, and adromycin. There's some mixed results when comparing BCG with mitomycin but most of the results do uh, tend to favor uh, BCG. There have been a number of meta-analysis looking at all the randomized trials, uh, comparing BCG with all the intravesical agents out there. There's actually been a recent publication uh, that's going to be on a different slide that looks at all the literature regarding uh, BCG, all intravesical agents. And uh, the trend is that uh, BCG is a better agent in not only reducing recurrence rate, but also having an impact on uh, progression. Uh, and one of the trials by Harry Herr from Memorial, the 10-year recurrence-free survival rates um, <clears throat> were 30% when intravesical BCG, especially given with maintenance uh, regimen, was given. Uh, there was no uh, impact uh, with intravesical chemotherapy. So for the optical, optimal efficacy of BCG, uh, on recurrence and progression, BCG should be given with a maintenance schedule. Uh, it's believed that at least one year of maintenance uh, BCG is required to show the superiority of BCG over mitomycin in preventing uh, recurrence and uh, progression and can actually improve the recurrence-free survival rates by about 20%. It does have some increased side effects, um, puts you at risk for something called BCGosis, um, there's some thought that if you decrease the dose of the maintenance regimen to one-third of the dose, this may have an impact. But nevertheless, some sort of maintenance regimen uh, should be utilized to maximize the benefit of BCG. When we're looking about carcinoma in situ, up to 50% of these patients will ultimately progress to muscle invasive disease and 10% will uh, metastasize. BCG is the mainstay of therapy for carcinoma in situ. Up to 70% of patients who are treated with BCG will have a response. People who are considered BCG failures can either get repeat installation of BCG combined with interferon. Uh, valrubicin is especially useful in this setting. It has a 20% response rate, especially for patients who are not candidates to undergoing uh, what we would call an early cystectomy. Uh, there are some experimental agents that are being utilized for carcinoma in situ. Uh, but uh, nothing that has really replaced BCG as the mainstay of therapy. For people who have failed intravesical treatment, if chemotherapy was the initial agent that was used, then the patient can certainly benefit from an additional round of using intravesical BCG. If BCG was the initial agent used, uh, one would be considered a failure if there's a higher number of recurrent lesions, there's an increase in the stage, uh, going now to, you know, T, T1 or T2, having concomitant carcinoma, carcinoma type 2, which is, which is new in, the, um, in this patient, uh, and having high-grade disease both at the three-month and six-month mark. If you give an additional course of BCG at the three-month um, uh, surveillance and there is high-grade disease but nevertheless has not progressed in stage, you can provoke a response in up to 50% uh, of patients. And this is the, uh, um, uh, the, the article that I was alluding to um, in Cancer treatment, treatment Reviews. It's an extensive review of all the literature regarding intravesical agents.
So the f high frequency of local recurrence and the potential for uh, stage progression, uh, especially for patients who have high-risk disease, really highlights the importance of vigilant surveillance with cystoscopy and cytology, and this is lifelong regardless of the grade and stages of the disease. So we frequently recommend cystoscopy with cytology every three months for the first two years after diagnosis. Once someone has gone two years without a recurrence, then you can extend that, that surveillance out to every six months for two years and then annually thereafter. As Dr. Shuckman mentioned, an annual upper tract surveillance is usually required to make sure that the ureters and the renal pelvis are not involved, that there is a 5% risk of that disease um, uh, going up. And the role of urine-based markers like NMP22 and the fish tests that Dr. Shuckman alluded to in the follow-up of patients remains uncertain. Certainly, it will not replace cystoscopy and cytology alone. Uh, these are some of the FDA-approved agents uh, we've already heard about. Uh, these are some interesting pictures of, of uh, CISVIEW. These are just white light uh, cystoscopic images of uh, patients with uh, history of bladder cancer when CISVIEW is utilized alongside it. Uh, lesions that it may not be readily apparent on white light microscopy uh, will have an abnormality and if biopsied will probably have uh, presence of cancer. So uh, in conclusion, non-invasive muscle, uh, non-muscle invasive uh, bladder cancer can really be separated out into two disease processes. There's a low grade TA disease which is bothersome but very treatable, usually just recurs and rarely progresses. Uh, T1 disease and carcinoma in situ are a whole different disease process. Uh, they could uh, be life-threatening and really uh, require accurate staging uh, and vi vi vigilant follow-up. So in terms of our needs for the future, we definitely need less invasive follow-up. You've heard about the cost related to all this follow-up. It's, uh, it's extensive, and we definitely need better invasions, interventions for high-risk patients to reduce their chance of progression and recurrence. Thank you.